Good evening, everyone. My name is Munishwan, and I love to explore technology. And more specifically, I like to think of uh, programming, computer programming, as a superpower. So I could create anything I want. Before I begin, I would like to give my heartfelt gratitude to the Rise of AI 2019 committee for inviting me and also bringing me over here. Thank you. Um, moving forward, uh, I would like to discuss a little, a little about myself first so that you guys can get familiar with me. So I'm currently studying 12th grade, so I would be going to university coming fall in coming August. So I love to explore technology. Most specifically, my passion is to build and innovate machines so that they could think and also solve our problems more creatively. So I started exploring technology from a really young age, so at about age three. I used to open up home appliances, you know, just to look inside and see how they function, and it was really interesting. A couple of years later, about age eight, I was fluent in nearly three programming languages, and I built an application that would help me improve my English vocabulary. And it was so good that uh, the te English test scores were substantially increased from the past tests. Uh, when I was about you know, 11 or 12, I was introduced to machine learning, and I built my first AI application. And it was a simple chatbot that would interact with me and also solve you know, simple mathematical problems. But my perspective about machines and why, why we need to use machines, or about AI, or about human-computer interaction, completely changed when I was in 10th grade. So when I was in 10th grade, I came across an incident that would completely change this perspective. So I came across an accident of a visually impaired person. And you know, this prompted me to look into the lives of the visually impaired. And most visually impaired people use rudimentary instruments to walk around their environment. For example, guiding sticks, or you know, uh, you have guided dogs that are trained to, trained to move the visually impaired people around their environment. So I do believe this was one of the reasons for the accident itself. So I thought to myself, why not use artificial intelligence you know, to help guide the visually impaired? So I came up with the solution. I came up with the solution. Basically, the device consists of a camera and a earphone. The camera scanned the environment and looked for any dangers like crossroads or potholes or even traffic signals and signal that back to the user using natural language itself. I also collaborated with several universities all over the world. Uh, in fact, a really good uh, course that I would recommend for, uh, for beginners is uh, by MITx on edX called Introduction to Computational Thinking and Data Science. I did collaborate with MIT to provide content for this course, and it has been tailored well. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you would enjoy it. When I was in 11th grade, I I got a chance to go to Harvard University and work on a mathematics research project. So in the end, I did, you know, because mathematics is the language of nature, and if you see deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, if you strip down everything, mathematics is the core. It is behind everything. So I do suggest you to, you know, look, look at math in deep learning as well. I have put forth two innovative projects that I had built um, a couple of while back for this conference. If you, if you notice, the, the universe, the human brain cells, and the internet all have something in common. They are all made up of similar structures. And I do believe decoding the human, human brain is a key to solving world problems, from poverty to climate control. And this decoding of this human mind is possible through machines. See, computers are really efficient at finding patterns. We can use computers to find the cause and effect relationship of anything in the data set. And we can do that using deep learning technology. So a lot of other speakers did give a good introduction to deep learning, so I'm just going to keep it a little bit vague. So deep learning is basically inspired by the workings of the human mind. And we are trying to kind of, you know, simulate how the human mind processes information on a computer. Right now, millions of devices use deep learning technology. In fact, the very application that I use to come to this event uses deep learning to find the fastest route to this conference. Although deep learning would have immense impact in the field of 
vast variety of fields, I believe its biggest impact would be in the field of healthcare. And why do I say this? Mainly because of the huge amounts of data the healthcare industry produces alone. In 2013, nearly 153 billion gigabytes of data were produced. At this astronomical rate of 48% annual growth, in 2020, we would have 23, 14 billion gigabytes of data. That's huge amounts of data. So what could we do with this data? There's so much data, but you know, because the, since healthcare industry produces huge amounts of data, we can use this data to find and find correlations in this data. For example, symptoms and uh, why why does this symptom appear when this disease is progressive? And we can do that using computers. As I said earlier, computers are really efficient at finding patterns. To illustrate this further, let's have an example. Let's say you have a number one, two, three, dash and dash. How many of you think the next two digits would be four and five? Okay, so I see more than 50%. But the actual answer is one, two, three, five, eight. You see, even if I had given one digit, say five, you would have guessed it correctly that it's one, two, three, five, eight. So the greater the amount of data we have, the greater is the amount, you know, greater the accuracy of finding that pattern. And uh, this project uh, called Project Health that I would like to introduce you to uh, is basically on the on the on the idea that you know you could could diagnose diseases early even before the symptoms appear. So my grandfather was suffering from Parkinson's, so and his death was due to the late diagnosis of this disorder. So I thought to myself, is there any way to decrease the diagnosis time? Across the world, we have access to healthcare that's very limited and also expensive. So even these two points have to be kept in mind while constructing this kind of instrument. Another problem with neurological disorders is the slow progressive nature of these diseases. Most neurological diseases progress at a slow pace. So for, for, uh, say uh, the actual onset of the disease would be 10 to 12 years prior to the actual symptom appearance. So you have 10 to 12 years of time gap when, the, when a, say, a person, for example, is suffering from Parkinson's. So when he's in the late 30s, he might, he might get some tremors in his hand. So, but he might you know, mistake it for, you know, he has taken too much coffee. But it was actually the disease that's showing the symptom. So after a couple of years, it gets worse. But, and after 10 or 12 years, it, it, it moves to the point where it's really hard to control it. So if the person would have known that he is suffering from Parkinson's 10 to 12 years prior to the actual onset of the symptoms, it could have been curbed and probably prolonged his life. So the idea is decreasing diagnosis time and also provide better patient care and feedback. So just, just like I said, let's go back to the Parkinson's example. So all the person has to wear is a band around his arm and it measures his tremor activity the amount of movement in his hand. So if, if the disease is progressing, the tremors would get worse. So you, there's, there's a clear cause and effect relationship between the symptom appearance and the disease. Greater the amount of disease progression, greater is the tremor. Also, it could also provide you know, feedback. Say a doctor does pro pro provide medication to him, and if the tremors don't subside, you would know for sure that this medicine is not having is not really effective for, at this point of time. It can do all this with an accuracy of greater than 92%. Another big project that I believe would have an impact in the lives of people is Project Life. Right now, a big problem exists in the field of mental health care. I'm talking about suicides. Nearly 800,000 people commit suicides every year. It burns me as I say this, but by the end of my talk, nearly 22 people would have taken their lives. Moreover, suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 29 year olds, that's youngsters. So why is suicide so hard to curb? Is it invisible? Diseases, say, like common cold, could be easily det detected because they, they show an external symptom that's very obvious, right? 
you have a runny nose. So if a person comes to you with a runny nose, you, you will know for sure that this person is suffering from common cold. But that's not the case for major depressive disorders like depression, right? Most, most diseases like this, they don't show their actual manifestation of externally. A person who is cheerful outside may not actually be happy inside. He might be just wearing a mask or facade. A person, for example, who is happy might sleep for 10 hours, but when he is in a different kind of emotional state, he might not sleep for 10 hours. He might sleep for four, he might sleep for two, or not sleep at all. The major problem in detecting these kind of neurological mental health problems is that they are not easily detectable. And we humans are not really good at recognizing these patterns as well. But machines are really good at recognizing these patterns. They're pattern-finding geniuses. So why not use a machine to detect the emotional state of a person? Right now, we do have solutions to curb suicides. For example, we have hotlines and we have mental health workers. But in our world, we don't have, some of these hotlines don't run 24 seven. And some of these hotlines, you know, you need to call at a specific time period on a specific day to receive emotional support. And also, we don't have much mental health workers. And what if the person doesn't ask for help? To answer the question, we need to answer ourselves, why won't the person ask for help? One of the biggest problem for a person in seeking help is the social stigma surrounding mental health disorders. Moreover, access to mental health care is expensive. So how do we curb these problems? The answer lies with machines. As I said earlier, computers are really efficient at finding patterns, and we humans exhibit behavioral changes outside when there is change in our mind. If a person is sad, he might not show it externally, but he might you know, show it indirectly. For example, he might not sleep that much, or he might not go for a walk. We carry devices that record all this hu human behavioral data, for example, smartwatches, smartphones, but most of this data is not used effectively. So we can track and analyze these changes and find correlations between the cause and effect. So if something's bothering a person, and he's not willing to share that information, we can know for sure that this person is in this emotional state and probably need to talk to him or even provide him support. And we can do that using deep learning technology. The way human brain solves problems is very efficient, and we're trying to kind of simulate that kind of efficiency on a computer, and that is very challenging. Since we carry these devices, say for example, there is this person, and whenever he's happy, he, you know, he goes for a walk to his job, which is nearby, to his home. But when he is in a, in a different emotional state, say he's depressed, he might not walk. He might take a cab. So there's a change in the amount of calorie burnt for the person. So that, that one data point is changed, right? So there is a correlation between his emotional state and the amount of calorie burnt. So we can analyze all this behavioral data to predict the emotional state. We can find these changes and predict the problem even before it becomes worse. Since we carry these devices everywhere, it's easier for us to, be, to build an application around these data points. And we can do that using deep learning technology. So it's basically like an application that runs on your phone that collects information about sleep data, and uh, your amount of calorie burned, how much steps you're taking, the, the kind of web searches you're doing. And based on that, it can predict what kind of emotional state you're in. We can f let's go back to the sleep time example. So a person who regularly sleeps at 10 p.m. and gets up at 8 a.m., whenever he does that regularly, he or she does that regularly, and that is completely changed, or there's a sudden change in this behavior when there is a difference in his emotional state. Say he gets fired from his job. So he might not sleep that much. He, he might have thoughts about, how do I pay my mortgage? How do I pay my loan? How do, how do I sustain? So he, it keep go, goes on in his mind, and he might not sleep much. He might not sleep at all. And this would get worse. And at some point, he might snap. 
We can also use behavioral data like workout routine and web suggests. A person who's on the verge of committing suicide might actually search on the web for most efficient way to die. So all this data included, we could predict with a reasonable accuracy whether this person is going to commit suicide or not. We can also provide help and also alert family members and loved ones. See, machines and humans are not two independent identities. We are we are codependent and we have co-evolved. Technology is not the problem, rather, technology is the solution. My aim is to provide affordable health care, and that is one of the reasons why I do what I do. My aim is to provide universal health care to everyone all over the world. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Is there some Q&A you would like to ask? Right behind you. Okay, thanks. Hi. That was a great presentation. So, thank you. a lot of the social projects, it's, it's hard to found it. Like, you know, there is, uh, I'm not sure whether there is money in it. Um, how you, I, and I believe it, social projects are very needed like mm -hmm. to help humans, especially the, the depression examples that you show. Uh, so um, how do you found, how this kind of projects can be founded? Okay, so you mean how can these kind, you, you mean funded? Yeah, like how, how, how do you get the money for it? Okay, so uh, the thing is, uh, you, you don't re really need capital to actually do something. That's one thing. So what I do is I gather information I get a lot of information, I have mentors all over the world, and they guide me, and I collaborate with companies all over the world. So you don't need capital, you can, you can, you know, you can, do, you can get information from them, you can say that, you know, uh, one, one good example is I collaborated with Nimhans. So it's a, it's a, it's a university hospital in, in Bangalore, and, uh, and you, can, you can interview patients, you can, you can ask them, how could I improve your life, you know? It's all about conveying, the need for this kind of projects. And you don't need exactly capital. Uh, if you mean, you mean like you need servers and everything, but uh, it's, it's again, you know, you can, you can do, that's, that's a small budget, right? So you can, it can come out of your product. Here's one more question. So do you also use uh, social media, like the acting of the person uh, on Facebook, for example? Okay, so the thing is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's all depends on the user. So he might be a little more, you know, skeptical about giving permission to each and every uh, object uh, app on the phone, right? So right now, I haven't scaled it up to social media, but all it can do is it can search for web, web results, or web searches, because, you know, some of these social media companies, you know, they don't really, you know, sell out data. And, uh, you know, some of these APIs are not present where you can access that kind of user data from, from those kind of companies, social media companies. But, uh, you know, web searches are really, you know, one way, you know, you could get information from, from the user directly. So uh, right now, all kind of data points that I have is the sleep data, then you have the amount of calorie burned, and then how many steps you have taken, and uh, web searches, as of now. <laughs> is there another question? Hi, um, I have a question with respect to the first question that was mm -hmm. asked. So as far as I know, for any healthcare research, you need ethical committee approvals. Right, exactly, yeah. And there are a lot of checks and balances in places, and they do require funding. I, I actually don't know of any research that doesn't require funding, because you need access to the data. And as far as I know, you cannot directly walk up to the patient and ask how they are doing. For that also, you need informed consent. And right, exactly, yeah. So uh, uh, I didn't get an idea from your talk of how you actually aim to do what you presented. So can you give us a... Sure, sure, okay. Uh, let me rewind back. Okay, so what, how did I go about this project? Let me tell you. So what I did was, once I got the idea, right, so I reached out to several university hospitals and I collaborated, I mean, I talked to several professors and what their idea about suicide was and, you know, uh, psychology. 
department and you know once everything you receive right then you can you know you can you, you don't need to i do believe that you need you do need to go to ethics department whether you need you know specific patient data but uh, this 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 kind of information that you get you don't need really need to you know um, it's kind of like uh, it's more uh, decentralized i would say because uh, these kind of uh, you know mood behaviors right you it's kind of an external that happens every day so and every time so you, it's it's kind of like a 24/7 process so you don't you can't really go and interview patient of, for you know whether you say he's depressed or not right so you can't go to a patient who's 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 actually suffering from depression and you know monitor his thing then then you, you kind of have an imbalance because this per person has actually come out and he has told that he is suffering from depression and he is seeking help but what i'm concentrating right now is a patients who don't you know people who don't you know seek help so you find correlations between some of these you know information and data points and then you know construct something that's valid out of that